Welcome again to our service. Let's begin by praying together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's say together. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for the, ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. 
He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. The reading is taken from John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness, to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. There's no shortage of ideas when it comes to young parents announcing the birth of their brand new baby. In our day, it was get on the telephone, you know, the ones with the real dial. Or if you were a bit more fancy, you would send out blue or pink cards with a little picture. Nowadays, everything is done online. Fancy videos with, with really clever birth announcements like, Heaven is missing a beautiful soul now that our baby was born. Or, after nine months of beauty sleep, here she is. Our home has grown by two feet. It's time for dirty diapers, sleepless nights, and endless love. Welcome, baby so-and-so. It goes without saying that these birth announcements are just a pale reflection of the joy that is experienced with the arrival of a brand new life. Let's pray before we look at the arrival of the baby Jesus and how he was received. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, we're looking at John chapter 1 today. And in this passage, the birth of Jesus produces a reaction. In fact, there are three reactions. St. John, the gospel writer, is he's kind of like your typical preacher who has a three-point sermon. So point number one, when Jesus arrived, people failed to recognize him. Verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Now you can't help 
But notice the irony of this. Because the very creator of the universe, the God who made the heavens above, the earth, people, the people don't recognize him. Because John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, no Bible reader can miss the point of the opening line of John chapter 1, verse 1, because it brings us right to the start of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth, but people do not recognize him. Indeed, when God sends his word, he sends it specifically to Israel, the chosen people, but they don't recognize him either. And that is the central problem that dominates much of the gospel story. Jesus comes to God's people, and God's people do what the rest of the world does. It says that they prefer darkness to light. Same point is made over and over again in the gospel accounts. And the question keeps coming up, who is this Jesus anyway? Some thought Jesus taught with authority, and they hung on every word that he spoke. Others believed he was speaking blasphemy. He was dangerous. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. Now, that was 2,000 years ago. Do you think that this is still true today? Of course it is. Why don't people recognize Jesus, the word full of grace and truth? Well, there's probably lots of reasons. And one of them, I think, is that a new philosophy, a new religion, as it were, has arisen which basically believes that there is no real truth. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Remember Pilate's question towards the ends of Jesus' life. What is truth? The great birth announcement of John chapter 1 says, There is truth. Truth that comes from outside the world and gives meaning to the world. The world doesn't make up this truth. It doesn't shape or change this truth. He is the truth. Not a truth for me and a different truth for you, but the truth for all of us. Unchanging, absolute. Now, there might have been a generation or a century when this simple, simple understanding from the Bible would not need to be stressed that there is truth, truth outside of my own mind, truth that I don't have to create, but discover that I don't control, but need to submit to. There may have been a time when we didn't have to proclaim this as part of the Christian message, but not today. Because we live in an age where even in many mainline churches, the truth is debated. If you try to claim today that there is such thing as absolute truth, you will very likely be considered misguided and sometimes even immoral. Some people believe that if you claim that there is absolute truth, it leads to intolerance, prejudice against what others think is true. They would prefer relativism. Relativism is the concept that points of view have no absolute truth or validity, having only relative, subjective 
value according to differences in perception and consideration. In other words, what is true for me is truth, and what is true for you is truth. Truth is relative. Relativ relativism says there is no such thing as absolute truth. And if we're lamenting the fact that in many places Christ has been taken out of Christmas, I think we need to see the deeper problem here, that truth has been taken out of reality. We need to be aware how deeply this particular view or non-view of truth is woven into the fabric of our culture today. It infects all of us, more or less. And I think there's one thing a university professor can be pretty certain of. Almost every student entering the university believes, or says he or she believes, that truth is relative. And worse, that absolute truth leads to intolerance and prejudice against what others think is true. And I think the strangest illustration of this that I found was on a leaflet from a pro-choice group that said, we will not tolerate intolerance. We will not tolerate intolerance is the moral equivalent of we absolutely reject absolutes. It is self-contradictory. It's a testimony to the fact that we can't live without absolute truth. And so it's not surprising then that relativism is also unbiblical. Later on in the gospel, according to St. John, Jesus will say, for this I was born and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Jesus' birth announcement says, there is truth, truth that comes from God outside the world and gives the world its meaning, truth that is absolute and unchanging, truth that everyone should seek for and submit to and believe. Truth is a person. It is Jesus Christ. However, some did not recognize him. Point number two. When Jesus arrived, they not only failed to recognize him, they rejected him. Verse 11. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Again, time after time, Jesus is rejected, even by his own family and friends. Remember when he preached his first sermon in his own hometown, Luke chapter 4. He comes to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home. He went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath, stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet is handed to Jesus. He unrolls the scroll found the place where this was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released. He rolls up the scroll, hands it back to the attendant, sits down. All eyes in the synagogue are looking at him intently. And then Jesus says, The scripture you've heard has been fulfilled this very day. This makes them all very upset. So upset, they try to throw him down a cliff. The religious leaders reject Jesus. Now you'd think the clergy, the spiritually minded, would accept him. Not so. Jesus offended them because he often spent time with the wrong kind of people, the lowly, the despised, the broken, those people who knew they needed a doctor. 
And Jesus would respond by saying, the healthy don't need a doctor, only the sick do. I came to those who know they are sick. I love the way the gospel writers do not try to pad that aspect of the story, to embellish the gospel, as it were, because you wouldn't make up that as part of the story. You would turn it all for good in the end. In other words, he came to his own, and they all loved and followed him and lived happily ever after. Amen. The end. But that's not what happens. He comes into the world, and they do not recognize him. Worse, he comes to his own, the ones who the Lord had revealed himself so many times before, but they also reject Jesus. It happens. They reject him. In fact, later on, they plot against him. We shouldn't be too shocked. Our own country was built on Judeo-Christian principles. Now we can't even pray in our schools anymore or say Christmas at Christmas time. It is very, very easy to reject. A baby in a crib is only a small bit of the story because we know that Jesus comes to die on a cross. He comes to die for those who, sick, who are sick, to those who know they need a doctor, who know they are sinners who are filled with darkness. And if that offends us, we should say good. That is what it is supposed to do. Offend us, challenge us, convict us. Make us feel badly enough that we repent and turn to God. There's no easy way to go forward. Repentance is the only way. Because repentance is basically the opposite of rejection. And finally, point number three of our three-point sermon. When Jesus arrives and is announced, some believed. Verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Some believed, and he gives them the right to become children of God. It's like the adoption papers have been signed. If you're familiar with the movie trilogy, The, the Born Identity, or it's, I guess it's more than a tri trilogy now, basically Jason Bourne spends most of the movie trying to discover who he really is, his true identity. It's a storyline of other stories as well. Who am I? We face that question all the time. Life, you see, has a way of confusing many people in this manner. Who am I? Well, I'm out of work, so that means I'm useless. I'm out of money or health. I have failed, thus I'm a failure. We confuse what has happened to us or what we do for who we are. You see, our deepest identity is found in God, in Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. It says here, to all who did receive him, he gives them, basically, a new identity, children of God. It is the greatest privilege, and it comes to all, to all. This is not normally what you think about. We live in an age where there are many hoops, as it were, to jump through, the good people, the smart people. But the Bible tells us here to all who would receive him. This is the guarantee, verse 13, not of human descent, but of God himself. We can't even do it ourselves. We are chosen. We are made his children by God. He does it all. They are reborn, a birth that comes from God. The way in which the individual becomes a child of God is not by a natural process, but by a supernatural process. There is a divine transaction 
as a result of a divine initiative. It is something that God in his incredible love and mercy and his grace does for you and for me. And this, of course, is the subject of the interaction later on in John chapter 3, when the religious individual Nicodemus approaches Jesus. And Jesus says, you've got to be born again, Nicodemus. And he says, born again? How do you get born again? And Jesus says, no, we're not talking about being physically born. We're talking about being spiritually born. Now, by the way, I'm not sure if you know this, but I actually remember when I was born. I remember when I was born. I remember it exactly. I remember saying to myself, I'd like to be born and I'd like to choose my parents, my mother to be called Helen. And I'd like to be born in November. I'd actually like to be born on the 20th of November, 1957 in Montreal, because I knew I would grow up and like the Montreal Canadiens Hockey Club. How much control did you or I have over our birth? None, none, zero. When God turns a light on in your heart and mine, you suddenly realize, you suddenly become against all odds, against your background, against your nature. You suddenly find yourself saying yes, to this Jesus. Yes, I welcome him. Yes, I receive him. Yes, I believe in him. It bears testimony to the manifold initiative of God coming to you by his son, Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it should humble us. This is all about God. This is all about Jesus. This is all about the power of the Holy Spirit. To those who believed in him, he gives the right to become children of God. I think this is all about God. Many of us have responded to that tug in our hearts, and we certainly thank God for it. And yet, on the other hand, for many people, the birth announcement has gone out 2,000 years ago. It is still ringing even today. And it is still waiting to be responded to. And we all know people that are in that category. So we pray. And let's remember them right now as we pray. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for my friends here gathered. I thank you, Lord, for opening up our minds and our hearts to the reality of Jesus Christ. And you would, would you stir within us, Lord, a prayer, a passion to pray for those who have not yet responded to the Lord Jesus Christ. We commit our family, our friends to the Lord Jesus even now. Lord, for many people who have turned their back on the things of the Spirit, who have turned their back on God. And we pray, Lord, for a mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God in our day. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our service in the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the words of the prayer of thanksgiving, let's pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all of your goodness and loving kindness to us 
and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful week.